There are from 600 to 650 different muscles in the body, and the number depends on which anatomist you ask. And when you first look at the various names of these muscles, it's bewildering. It seems like just a mess of Greek and Latin. Well, sometimes muscle names kind of are a mess. However, there is an underlying rationale or system to their naming. It's hard to see until you study it, but there is logic and order involved. The words used in the names have a specific meaning that refer to some characteristic of the muscle. Now, after a while, by understanding the meaning of these words, you may be able to figure out a few things about a muscle based on its name alone. Here is an obvious muscle characteristic that can influence the name of the muscle. Size. Everybody knows about the gluteus maximus. Well, the word maximus means largest. Often, as in this case, the size is relative to some other paired muscle in the same muscle group. So the gluteus maximus is the largest muscle of the buttock. The gluteus minimus is the smallest muscle of the buttock. Maximus means largest, so minimus must mean smallest. So let's go over briefly some of the characteristics of muscles that are used to name them. I will try to give an example concerning each. Afterwards, the next few videos will explain specific types of muscle words. Muscles may be named according to any of the following characteristics. Next is where is the muscle located? So location could refer to the body part or to the origin and insertion of the muscle or even to relative location. Uh, an example is biceps brachii, uh, which is named by the body part it's located on. Let's ignore the word biceps, which we'll come to later, and focus on brachii. This word describes the location of the muscle, so the word brachii refers to the arm. In fact, the muscle is located in the anterior or front part of the upper arm. And you should know also, by the way, that when we say arm in anatomy, or kinesiology, we're almost always talking about the upper arm. Okay, we, we use the, the word forearm for the distal part or the part below the elbow. So brachii refers to location, but location can also be described by the origin and insertion of the muscle. And also remember, a, a mixture of basic location and insertion might be used. There are no rules. Uh, so an example of origin and insertion is the sternocleidomastoid. So sterno and clido refer to its origin on the sternum and clavicle. And mastoid refers to its insertion on the mastoid process. And one more way location is used is rel relative location. So uh, it's a location relative to something else in the body. For, so for instance, a muscle may be named because it is below or beneath something else in the body, such as the infraspinatus. Now it would be confusing um, to lump all these three different ways uh, location words are used into one grouping. So in the videos to follow, I'll consider these three different types of location uh, separately. The next characteristic that can influence the name of the muscle, and I'm not going over these in any specific order, but the next characteristic is what is its basic shape? What does the muscle look like? Now I'm sticking to familiar examples here, but as I said, the next few videos will go further into specific words and I'll give more examples then. So one example of a shape word for muscle is the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. Deltoid means triangular. The deltoid is a somewhat triangular muscle. So this is one of those times that the name alone will not tell you very much and when in terms of shape, this is going to be the case with any muscle that is named primarily by its shape. The next characteristic that can influence the name of a muscle is its function. So what is its primary action? Does it extend a joint or flex a joint or does it do something else? So muscles uh, can often be said to have more than one role in the body depending on the specific joint movement happening but they can usually be said to have a primary action uh, and certainly the muscles that are named this way do. Muscles named this way, by the way, don't have a lot of well-known examples. These are more obscure muscles that a lot of people haven't heard of, but let's use the levator scapula, which is a paired muscle of the neck, as an example. 
And before someone tries to correct my pronunciation, because I've seen this done on YouTube a lot, um, yes, it's spelled scapulae with an A-E, but hardly anyone says it that way. So anyway, levator means to lift. It refers to elevating or raising up, and it's applied to several muscles in the body that have this role of raising or lifting up a part. And the part they lift up will be the part into which they are inserted. So the levator scapula elevates or lifts up the scapula. And right now, you, there you can see, you could have figured out a lot about this muscle if you know the meaning of the word levator. You might have figured out right away, oh, this must raise up the scapula. The next characteristic that can influence the way a muscle is named is how many origins does it have? Now this one's a little trickier because you need to know first that some muscles have more than one origin and they can sometimes separate on the origin end of the muscle into separate divisions that attach at different places. Now you can also say that the muscle arises or originates from two separate divisions and converges into one muscle. So it depends on how you look at it. But anyway, these divisions are called heads. So now we go back to the biceps brachii. Biceps means a two-headed muscle. Um, bi means two, and the suffix seps means head. So we know it is a muscle of the upper arm from the word brachii. So now we know that biceps brachii means a two-headed muscle of the arm. And all the muscles that are named this way have this pattern. A part of the word, the prefix, referring to the number, and then the suffix, seps. So again, the biceps has two divisions, and these divisions, or heads, separate into two distinct halves as the muscle approaches the shoulder, and each of these heads has its own tendon, which attaches to different places. Okay, while I'm at it, let's answer the age-old question, do you say bicep or biceps? Well, seps refers to the muscle's head, and to be honest, I don't know why the S is on the end. Uh, it comes from the Greek caput, which means head, and we actually see another word from this which refers to the head proper, cephalic. Um, biceps is a singular word. Uh, so to refer to both your bicep muscles, you have to say both biceps, or logically something like bicepsis, you know, which ain't going to happen. Um, so at some point, uh, and this came into usage as early as the 1940s, I'm, I'm pretty sure, the word biceps got kind of backformed into bicep without the S to refer to one bicep muscle. Now, a lot, often when people start learning more and they get all studious, you know, this causes a conundrum when people are talking about one of their biceps muscles. So, you, do you say my biceps or my bicep to make it clear you mean one? So, folks, you can say it either way. And in conventional, you know, conventional usage, uh, you're going to sound kind of silly if you go out of your way to always put the S on the end. Uh, I say biceps sometimes, but most of the time I say bicep and I drop the S. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, just an aside. The next characteristic which can influence the name of a muscle is the muscle orientation relative to the midline of the body. Or in other words, in what direction do the fibers of the muscle run in relation to the midline? An example is the transversus abdominis, or just transverse abdominis. So transversus, of course, means transverse or perpendicular. So this is a muscle of the abdomen that runs perpendicular to the midline. And that should cover pretty much all the basic characteristics that are used to name muscles. Uh, please look for more videos to come, which will cover in more detail specific words for each type of characteristic covered here.